Littleton Coin Company is ringing in the holiday season with daily deals. Visit littletoncoin.com for at least 15% off select products now through November 28th. Save on your favorite coins, such as Morgan Silver Dollars, Kennedy Half Dollars, Commemorative Quarters, and much more. But hurry, each day offers a new deal you don't want to miss. Visit us now at littletoncoin.com. That's littletoncoin.com. Littleton Coin Company, serving collectors since 1945. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 41. Coming up on Space Time, could there be parts of another planet inside the Earth? The anatomy of a Nova explosion? And China continues to gear up for war with the launch of yet another spy satellite. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new hypothesis claims that large parts of the planet Thea may still be present buried deep inside the Earth's mantle. According to the giant impact theory, a Mars-sized planet called Thea slammed into the early proto-Earth about 4.5 billion years ago, melting both worlds into a magma ocean. Molten debris ejector from that collision was threatening to orbit around the Earth, eventually cooling and coalescing to form the Moon. Scientists have always figured that Thea and the Proto-Earth melded together. But a new hypothesis by researchers from Arizona State University suggests that huge blobs of material in Earth's mantle, known as large low-shear velocity provinces, may in reality be leftover chunks of the planet Thea. The large low-shear velocity provinces were identified because they comprised denser material than the rest of the Earth's mantle. That denser material causes seismic waves to slow down as they pass through it. The readings suggest that these provinces are very large and rest in the mantle sitting on the rim of the planet's outer core. One huge piece is located beneath the African continent and another beneath the Pacific Ocean. The Arizona State University team argue that if Thea's mantle was rich in iron, it would have been denser than the Proto-Earth's mantle and any of it that made its way into the mantle would eventually work its way down to the edge of the outer core. The authors suggest that most of Thea was destroyed in the impact, with some pieces flung into space to create the moon, but that most of its mantle broke into fragments which then sank through the Earth's mantle over billions of years, eventually merging to form the large low-shear velocity provinces. The hypothesis presented at this year's Lunar and Planetary Science Conference is being published in the journal Geophysical Research Letters. This is space time. Still to come, astronomers gather their best observations yet of a spectacular stellar explosion called a nova, and China continuing its military build-up with the launch of yet another spy satellite. All that and more still to come on space time. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Astronomers have gathered their best observations yet of a spectacular type of stellar explosion called a nova. The blast was captured in both visible and gamma rays by a trio of space-based telescopes and ground-based observatories. 
The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, has provided the first direct evidence that most of the nova's visible light is generated by shock waves in the explosion debris. A nova, or new star, is actually a sudden short-lived massive explosion on the surface of a type of star known as a white dwarf, the stellar corpse of a dead sun-like star. If the white dwarf is in a close binary system with another star, such as a red giant, its intense gravity will draw material off its bloated red giant companion. That material then builds up on the surface of the white dwarf until it accumulates enough mass and hence pressure to trigger a sudden thermonuclear explosion on the surface, burning off the excess material and causing the white dwarf to briefly brighten dramatically before fading again. That's the nova. Because the white dwarf isn't destroyed in the explosion as it would be in a type 1a supernova event, it starts drawing off more material from its companion red giant and the cycle repeats itself. This can happen multiple times. But there are many aspects of novae that remain a mystery. The exceptional quality of the observations in this data allowed astronomers to distinguish simultaneous flares in both optical and gamma ray light, providing clear evidence that shockwaves play a major role in powering some stellar explosions. The nova originated in the V906 Karaini star system, located some 13,000 light years away in the constellation Corina the Keel. Over time, perhaps tens of thousands of years, for a so-called classical nova like V906 Corini, the white dwarf's deepening hydrogen layer reaches critical temperatures and pressures. It then erupts in a runaway reaction that blows off all of the accumulated material. Each nova explosion releases a total of 10,000 to 100,000 times the annual energy output of our sun. Astronomers discover around 10 novae in the Milky Way galaxy every year. NASA's Fermi and New Star Space Telescopes, together with the Canadian Bright Toronto Satellite and several ground-based observatories, were used to study this nova, which erupted in 2018. Although X-ray and radio studies had shown the presence of shockwaves in nova debris in the weeks after the explosion reached its peak brightness, the Fermi gamma ray discovery came as a complete surprise. Gamma rays, the highest energy form of photons, require processes that accelerate subatomic particles to extreme energies. When these particles interact with each other and other matter, they produce gamma rays. But astronomers didn't expect novae to be powerful enough to produce the required amount of acceleration. Because the gamma rays appeared at about the same time as the peak in visible light, astronomers concluded that the shock waves play a fundamental role in the explosion and its aftermath. One of the study's authors, Koji Mukai, from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says when astronomers compared the Fermi and Bright data, they could see flares in both at about the same time, so they must share the same source, shockwaves in fast-moving debris with gamma rays driving the optical flares. Scientists also observed the eruption's final flare using NASA's New Star Space Telescope, which is only the second time the spacecraft detected X-rays during a nova's optical and gamma-ray emission. Putting all of the observations together, the authors believe that during the outburst's first few days, the orbital motion of the star swept a thick debris cloud made of multiple shells of gas into a donut or torus shape that appeared roughly edge-on from our perspective here on Earth. That cloud was expanding outwards at about 2.2 million kilometres per hour. That's comparable with the average speed of the solar wind flowing out from the sun. Then an outflow moving twice as fast slammed into the denser structures within the donut, creating shockwaves that emitted gamma rays in visible light, including at least four initial optical flares. Finally, around 20 days after the initial explosion, an even faster outflow crashed into all of the slower debris at around 9 million kilometres per hour generating new shockwaves and another round of gamma ray and optical flares. The nova outflows likely arose from residual nuclear fusion reactions on the white dwarf surface. This report from NASA TV. Now and then, an obscure star briefly flares up, brightening up to a million times. It's an event called a nova. The star V906 Carini erupted as a nova in 2018. Observations from three satellites provide new insights into what happened. NASA's Fermi mission has seen 14 novae since 2010. Before then, astronomers didn't think novae could glow in gamma rays, the highest energy light. When a white dwarf pulls material from a companion star, 
the gas forms a thickening layer that eventually erupts in a thermonuclear fireball. A nova is born. Led by a team from Michigan State University, astronomers studied V906 Carini using high-energy data from Fermi, NASA's New Star X-ray telescope, and invisible light from a Canadian satellite named Bright Toronto. Shaped by the orbital motion of the stars, the explosion debris first forms a thick, expanding ring around the system. Then, after 10 days or so, fast outflows, likely driven by residual fusion on the white dwarf, strike the ring. The resulting shock waves produce gamma ray and optical flares that radiate away most of the nova's energy. These observations provide the first direct evidence that shock waves can power most of a stellar explosion's visible light. Figuring out how they work in nearby novae will help us understand more powerful events much deeper in the cosmos. This is Space Time. Still to come, China continue its military build-up with the launch of yet another spy satellite. And later in the science report, a new study suggests that older people have a greater risk of catching COVID-19 twice. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account, where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. China is continuing its military buildup with the launch of yet another spy satellite. The Gaofeng 1202 was launched aboard a Long March 4C rocket from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China. Beijing describes the satellite as being designed for land surveys, urban planning, road network design, crop yield estimation, and disaster relief. In reality, Gaofeng 1202 is the latest in China's massive buildup of high-resolution surveillance satellites designed to provide the People's Liberation Army with continuous orbital coverage of strategic locations on the ground considers of military importance. Based on the launch capacity of the Long March 4C, the satellite has a mass of some 3,000 kilograms, and that suggests it's using a panchromatic multispectral microwave remote imaging system. It has better than half a metre ground-level resolution and is designed to provide near-real-time, all-weather, global surveillance. Hardly what's needed for land surveys, urban planning or road network design. The spacecraft's been placed into a 600-kilometre-high sun-synchronous orbit. The mission was the 364th flight of a Long March rocket series. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study suggests that older people have a greater risk of catching COVID-19 twice. Natural infection with SARS-CoV-2 protects against reinfection in most people. But scientists have found that this protection is significantly weaker in those aged 65 years and older. The findings, reported in the Lancet Medical Journal, are based on an analysis of millions of coronavirus test results in Denmark, which showed that at around six months after initial infection, protection against repeated infection was approximately 80%, with no significant difference in reinfection rates between men and women. But the authors found this protection was reduced to just 47% for those aged 65 years and older. Almost 3 million people have now died from the COVID-19 virus and another 135 million have been infected since the deadly disease first emerged from Wuhan, China and spread around the world. Scientists have now confirmed previous models which suggested that Antarctica's Pine Island Glacier could cross a series of tipping points leading to a rapid and irreversible retreat which would have significant consequences for global sea levels. 
The Pine Island Glacier is a region of fast-flowing ice, which together with its neighbouring Thwaites Glacier are responsible for about 10% of all ongoing global sea level increase. Now, a study reported in the journal Cryosphere shows that the glacier has at least three distinct tipping points, with a third and final event triggered by ocean temperatures increasing by 1.2 degrees Celsius, leading to an irreversible retreat of the entire glacier. The authors warned that temperature changes are likely to cause long-term warming and shoaling trends in circumpolar deep water, which, in combination with changing wind patterns in the Amundsen Sea, could expose Pine Island Glacier's ice shelf to warmer waters for longer periods of time. A new study may have determined why people with red hair have a different pain threshold compared to other people. The research, reported in the journal Science Advances, found that people with red hair and the pigment-producing skin cells called melanocytes contain a variant form of the melanocortin-1 receptor. This receptor sits on the cell's surface, and if it becomes activated by circulating hormones called melanocortins, it causes the melanocyte to switch from generating red-yellow melanin pigment to producing brown-black melanin pigment instead. The authors found that the loss of the melanocortin-1 receptor causes melanocytes to secrete lower levels of a molecule called POMOC that is subsequently cut into different hormones, including one that sensitizes to pain and another that blocks pain. The presence of these hormones maintains a balance between opioid receptors that inhibit pain and melanocortin-4 receptors that enhance pain perception. Having both hormones at low levels would seemingly cancel each other out. However, the body also produces additional non-melanocyte-related factors that activate opioid receptors involved in blocking pain. Therefore, the overall effect of lower levels of the melanocyte-related hormones is more opioid signals, which elevates the threshold for pain. Archaeologists have described a stunning collection of Arnhem Land rock art images, including three rare depictions of bilbies and a dugong. A report in the journal Australian Archaeology Today claims scientists from Griffith University documented some 574 previously unknown images ranging in age from 6,000 to 9,400 years from some 87 sites. Known as the Maliwara figures, they were found in northwestern Arnhem Land between Mount Borodale and the Wellington Range. They include large, sometimes life-size, naturalistic human figures and macropods painted in various shades of red with stroke infill or outline forms with a few red strokes as infill. They're shown with little material culture other than various forms of headdress. Scientists say the rock art provides a window into the past, showing solitary figures and group scenes displaying various activities and possible ceremonial events. Well, if you're on Facebook, you're probably one of the 533 million people who have now had their personal details leaked onto the internet. The information leaked includes your phone numbers, your full names, location, email address, and biographical information. The news comes as Facebook admits that it's identified over 14 million malevolent users and 83 million false accounts. This isn't the first time Facebook's been sloppy with security over people's private details, as Alex Saharov Royt from ity.com reports. Yes, look, I remember a tweet that was talking about how Facebook has been on an apology tour for the past <laughs> 15 or more years, apologizing for all kinds of various uh, you know, infractions with people's security. And back in 2020, there was a, a vulnerability that was allowing people to see the phone number linked to every Facebook account, and it was exploited, which created a database containing the information of 533 million users across all countries. And a, uh, a guy called Alon Gal, who's the CTO of a cybercrime intelligence firm called Hudson Rock, put a tweet a couple of days ago that talked about how all 533 million Facebook records were just leaked for free and they were being offered on Telegram and are available to download online. So the chances are is that your number, which probably haven't changed, has been leaked and along with full names, location, email address and biographical information. Now that could be used for identity theft or other nefarious purposes. But we also don't know how secure Facebook is going to be in the future. I mean, you know, this leak is for data that's a couple of years old, but most people would have been on Facebook for years. And even if you change your phone number, even if you close your Facebook account, all that other information is still out there. And even if you use a VPN or antivirus software, I mean, none of that protects you from information being hacked or leaked from 
a company, and there are leaks happening all the time. It's unbelievable how how much of a cyber war we seem to be going through, a, a cyber cold war, and it's only going to get worse this decade. Meaning that you know you as an end user really have to be careful about what information you put out online and how well you keep your digital life secure. But that's always been the case, hasn't it? Well, it always has been. Yeah, I mean, I remember people initially were logging into social media services with fake information, and you can still open up a Gmail account and put whatever name you want. I mean, that has never changed, but it may well change in the future. And you know, we are trusting that these companies are keeping hold of our data in a very secure manner. And you know, the, the endless number of leaks goes to show that that's just not happening. April 1st is probably the only time people really look carefully at what they're reading online, even though they should be doing it all the time. Um, because it is April Fool's Day. But uh, it's more than that. There are quite a few milestones in history. Yeah, well, April 1 saw Apple's 45th birthday. They started on the 1st of April 1976, and Gmail arrived in 2004, making it 17 years old. At the time, Gmail was offering 1,000 megabytes or a gigabyte of storage when the Microsoft and Hotmail service was either offering 10 or 100 meg, I can't remember which. But this jump with Gmail was so huge that people thought, oh, well, April 1, it's a fool's joke. But it turned out to be quite true. A lot of other things happened in early April. In 1981, we had the first successful portable computer, which is known as the Osborne. If you have a look online, you can see it looks like a sewing machine uh, on its side and it was very heavy. And the Osborne people pre-announced the second version months before it was available and it caused sales of their first computer to dry up and it basically crueled the company. And also on April the 3rd in 1973, the first modern mobile phone call was made. That makes the modern, the portable mobile phone 48 years old. But actually, prior to that, you had mobile phones installed in cars. And the first, the first yeah, with fully those autom- shaped antennas on the boot, they were boomerang. Shaped, like the, shaped like a boomerang. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first fully automated mobile phone system for vehicles was launched in Sweden in 1956. But Dr. Martin Cooper was the Motorola researcher and executive who made the first phone call. And he did it to his competitor, Dr. Joel S. Engel of Bell Labs, who was his rival. Now, this first prototype phone was uh, 1.1 kilograms or 2.4 pounds. It took 10 hours to recharge and offered 30 minutes of talk time. So we've come a long, long way since those early days. Look, we've got to end with a bit of a shock this week. LG saying ta-ta. Yes, they've decided to quit the mobile phone business, uh, which has come as a bit of a shock. But also by the same token, LG, although they had a number of firsts and uh, interesting designs, they never really captured the mobile phone world the way that uh, Samsung has or even Motorola and and others. But LG, although they were the first to bring out a widescreen camera on the back of their phones and they had 18 by 9 aspect ratios, they had phones with dual screens, they had modular phones, they even had a thing launched late last year called the Wing where you had the second screen that popped out and the phone looked like a letter T with a screen at the top and a screen at the bottom. Uh, They just could never sell enough of them. So they have quit the mobile business. Uh, They'll stop selling phones by July this year. But they did have innovations like the rollable screen, which can convert a standard looking mobile phone into what appears to be an eight inch tablet without folds. We were talking about that earlier this year, you and I. That's right. Yeah. And uh, no doubt LG will sell that technology to others. A number of iPhones use LG screens, for example. And so an L- LG is going to move on to electric vehicles and home automation. And, you know, they make a lot of consumer appliances. And so LG is not disappearing, but their mobile phone business is. That's Alex Ahar of Royd from ITY.com. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. 
That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account. Where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC.